Acts chapter number 8, I'm just going to preach to you a few minutes, Acts chapter number 8, and we'll start in verse number 1, Acts chapter 8 and verse number 1. I love the book of Acts, I love the early accounts of the church, the early church, and here we do have an account of the early church, and a man by the name of Saul, who later would begin, we know as Paul, and now I'll be honest, this, this message, I'm just going to warn you, there ought to be a warning label on it. And uh, it's a little warm, amen, and uh, it tends to be direct, but it is, it is, it is for the church, and, uh, and so it is Bible, and, uh, and it, it is to make the church healthy. I, I'm, for instance, you know, uh, an, a healthy church is one that hears truth. A healthy church is not one that just hears, but, do, but, but does, and uh, not just hearers, but, but doers, and so... I'm going to preach it. It'll be, it'll be direct. It, it won't be in a bad spirit, of course. Hopefully, I, I, I won't ever preach a message in a, in a bad, mean, hateful spirit. I have before. I don't want to ever do it again. And, uh, but, you know, it's easy for a preacher to do and uh, to, to get ticked off at somebody and preach something. And, and uh, we've, done, we've all done it. And if a preacher says he's never done it, then he's lying. Amen. We've all preached out of a hateful spirit. And, uh, and we've had to apologize to God for it and apologize to the people for it because that ain't right. And uh, it ain't right. You're preaching in the flesh. You're not preaching in the spirit. I've done it on numerous occasions. And, uh, and God never does bless. He never does bless nobody doing that. And you say, well, I'll fix that problem from the pulpit. Well, the only person that can fix anything is God. And you just preach the word. And, and now sometimes God puts a message on a preacher's heart and it's, it just needs to be addressed. But don't ever preach because you're ticked off at somebody. And that's, that's not good. Be, t- be ticked off at yourself and over sin, uh, but don't ever be ticked off at somebody because that, that does not do the church any good whatsoever, and it does not do you good, and it certainly doesn't exalt, exalt Christ. Uh, Acts chapter number 8, verse number 1, And Saul was cont- consenting unto his death. And at that time, there was great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church. Notice that. Entering into every house and hailing men and women committed them to prison. Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to preach. I pray you bless it now in Jesus' name. Amen. Here we see Saul uh, before his conversion. And we see Saul, he is making havoc of the church. He's going in and persecuting the church. Wherever he would find the church of God meeting, he would go in, he would make havoc of it, whatever that caused, whether he beat people, whether he imprisoned them, whether he uh, would drag them out in the street, whether he would humiliate them, whatever it was, Saul was an evil man, and Saul hated Christ, he hated anything to do with the church, he hated the apostles, he did not like what was going on. I want to just preach a little while tonight on making havoc of the church. Making havoc of the church. The church is the bride of Christ. Amen. Amen. The church is the bride of Christ. And if you don't like the bride of Christ, if you don't love Christ, uh, then you don't love the church. And if you don't love the church, then you don't love Christ. Amen. Because that's just the way that God has set it up is... He, this is His bride, and if you badmouth the bride, then you're badmouthing Him. Amen? Because that's the bride of Christ. Hey, let me just give you some warning, church. If you badmouth my wife, you have got another enemy. And it's called me. Now, there's folks that can say anything they want to about me. I told my wife today, I said, Honey, man, if anybody ever leaves the church and it's because of me, and I did them wrong, and I made them mad over me, like something I did, not something I preached, something that I did, then it makes me feel awful. 
But I can expect throughout the years that folks are just going to say negative things about me. They may not like the way I look. They may not like that I wear glasses. Amen. They may not like that you're uh, uh, five foot ten. They may not like that, you know, I, I don't know. They may not like your demeanor. They, don't, they may not like the way you preach. They may not like you. Therefore, they'll talk about you or they'll put something out there and you'll hear about it. And, but you know what? It's one thing for somebody to say something about me, Brother Roy. But it's another thing to say something about my wife. Because see, to me, it, it, it hurts a little bit. You know that, that phrase, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me? That's a lie. Amen? I mean, that is. Uh, if somebody ever say, I, We used to say that all the time. We were kids. All you can't, whatever uh, you say to me, it's like rubber and glue. and Or uh, what words are like uh, rubber and uh, something like glue, and it bounces off me and sticks back to you. Something like that. It's such a stupid little thing. But anyway, uh, we would say those little things. But you know what? Then we'd go behind the, we'd go behind the, the, uh, the, the slinky or what, the slippery slide or whatever they were, and we'd cry. Johnny called me an idiot, you know, we, and, uh, and, and, you know, what's, I thought you said you were rubber, and, and, and it bounced off you, I was lying, and, and, uh, and we, we, you know, we call each other names, and all that kind of stuff, words do hurt, but let me just say something, you say something about my children, or you say something about my wife, then we're going to have a little chat, amen, because, hey, that's my bride. That's my bride. You, you say anything you want to. You may not like me, and it's a free country, but you say something about my family. Boy, we got a problem. Because I love my family. I love my... Jesus feels the same way about His bride. It's called the church. And you say something about the church. You start making havoc in the church. Let me just tell you, uh, 1 John 3, 14, we know that we have been passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. That's Scripture. Amen? And that's tough Scripture sometimes to follow. And, and I'll tell you this though, uh, when you're sitting in the church tonight, look across the aisle. If you're saved and that other person's saved, you're brothers and sisters in Christ. And the Bible says that if you can't love the brethren, you abide in death. That means you. there's a good chance that you might not even be saved. Amen. I'll tell, you, I'll, I'll tell you this, it's a strong statement, but those that cannot get along with others all the time. Now, I, I, there's going to be division sometimes. There's going to be some circumstances. I'm not saying this is every time. Those that constantly find themselves on the outs with people in the church, constantly, I doubt they're saved. I doubt they're saved. I'm not saying they're not saved. I said I doubt. A court, is it not Bible? I didn't say it. God said it. Someone that causes division in the church constantly. Yeah, well, they got right with that person, but now they're mad at that person. Well, they get right with that person, now they're mad at that person. And constantly, just in the outs with somebody, I wonder, I wonder, do they even love the brethren? That is a sign of salvation. That is a whole different message. And it ain't very nice either. And so we're just going to move on to this one, amen? And uh, keep on this one, amen? Making havoc of the church. These are healthy sermons, by the way. They're healthy sermons. It's like that medicine that you hate to swallow, but you need to swallow it to get better. This is one of them, and uh, penicillin or whatever you want to call it. It's nasty, but it sure does help. Number one, let me remind you, the church is His church. Not my church. It's not the deacon's church. It's His church. So we need to make sure that we, that we run it His way and not our way. He purchased the church at Calvary. He pardoned the church. He forgave it. He prays for the church. He's on the right hand of the Father. Uh, his power is on the church. It's called the Holy Ghost. Amen? And we ought to have power uh, when we go out and witness. Hey, the church is in the midst of the battle in these days. This day and age in which we live, it is not very popular to be an independent Baptist church member. Uh, there's sometimes when you get ridiculed. Sometimes you get persecuted. It is not very popular, but here we would... We would say many would try to do as Paul did, or Saul rather, and make havoc of the church. You say, what does the word havoc mean? Uh, the word havoc means waste, devastation, wide, general destruction. Uh, to havoc means to waste, destroy, to lay waste, to waste or havoc 
in a yonder world. Uh, this is exactly what havoc means. When you go in and you waste and you devastate and you have destruction, there are literally people that would go into the church and not do outer destruction where you could visibly see it, but they would make havoc in the church to sow discord and destroy the church. Now, I want to give you a few things. How does this happen? We make havoc, number one, when we desert the meetings of the church. When we desert the meetings of the church. What's John 20, 24? But Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. Now, why did Thomas doubt? I believe one reason why Thomas doubted was because he wasn't present. You know, in order to be somewhere... Folks, listen, it, just the bottom line goes, you need to be when the church doors are open and you need to try to get here. I mean, there's really no other nice... I, I mean, when the doors are squeaking, you need to be walking through them. Amen. Amen. Try to make it to regular meetings. I mean, Sunday school. Hey, folks, listen, I know it's an hour earlier than the regular preaching service, but if the church is having Sunday school and there is teaching in the Word of God, it should be a priority. I realize you can't make it to everything, but and I, you say, well, that extra hour on Sunday, it really does help me. I tell you this, an extra hour in Sunday school will help you a whole lot more than an extra hour of sleep. We've been teaching through Jonah. And let me just tell you right now, God has spoke to my heart. Sunday school, them regular meetings, preaching service, Sunday morning, Sunday night. Hey, if, you, if your schedule allows, be back on Wednesday night prayer meeting. You say, why? It is a regular meeting instituted by the Baptist church. Amen. If we had Wednesday night in, or Tuesday night instead of Wednesday night or Thursday night instead of Wednesday night, then you ought to be there. But God chose or the, the founding people of Bible Baptist Church chose to, to have Wednesday night prayer meeting on Wednesday night. And you know what? We ought to try. Listen, we ought to try to be where uh, the, the doors are open to the church. You know, there's a lot of churches today, they're not even having their doors open on Wednesday night. They're not having their doors on Sunday night. And you need to be there if your schedule allows. I'm, when you schedule, I'm talking about sometimes you got to work and sometimes you got things, sickness and other things. But folks, hey, sometimes we just miss because we miss. We're discouraged. We don't want to go. We don't feel like it. But that's not a good reason. We see regular meetings. We desert the meetings of the church. Well, how do we make havoc, preacher? We desert the meetings of the church. Regular meetings. Required meetings. You say, what do you mean? Well, like revival. You know, folks, we, we, I, we got a revival scheduled in November. That's not optional. I mean, we're going through... Listen, folks, look at me. Well, I don't need revival. I was there on Sunday. No, we need revival way more than we think we need revival. If you've got that attitude, you need to be here. You need to help open the church up. I mean, we're having revival. We got, well, I think we got two scheduled revivals in the spring, and, the, and we may have another special something coming up. We got missions conference in January. I've got a great preacher scheduled for our revival. Actually, we've got three different preachers for our revival. Couldn't get the one to stay all the way through, and, and, and it just it worked out good. And we've got some good Bible preachers starting on Sunday through Wednesday night uh, in November, uh, one of the weeks in November. I believe it'll be wonderful. We'll call it our fall revival. But I want us, listen, I want, I want a good showing anytime we say we're having a meeting, uh, a revival, a choir singing. Amen. I believe one day the future of our choirs will go to other churches and be a blessing. But you know, choir's not an option. When did choir become an option? If you started singing in the choir, bless God, you ought to still be in the choir. Amen. I've even put a bless God on that. You, you listen, you say, well, I'll sing in the choir when I feel like singing in the choir. Then listen, do us a favor and, still, and stay out there. Amen, Brother Peter. That's like, you know, what about the NBA? What about the NBA that says, uh, well, I'll show up to the game when I feel like showing up. What kind of coach would want players that show up when they feel like showing up? Oh, we wouldn't want them, but how about a choir that sings for God? I'm telling you, if you sing in this choir, it is a big deal. 
It is a big deal. It's a big deal when we practice. It's a big deal when we sing. It is not an option. It shouldn't be, well, I don't feel like it tonight. I don't feel like singing. Hey, unless you've got laryngitis or unless you're down with a sickness or unless you don't, you know. And, and listen, I, folks, the choir is, is you are what sets the tone for the message. Amen. I mean, we labor through the week. Your brother Jacob, brother Peter... And we'll talk, and, and Miss Christy, we try to all get on the same page. What are we going to sing? The choir specials, uh, the, uh, the offertory, the, the congregation. You say, oh, y'all just get up there and, no, oh, which one are we going to sing? Here. No, we don't do that. We're going to even try to do a better job. Folks, it is prayed over. It is thought through. It is prepared. And if we don't have folks singing in the choir, then it falls through. It's a big deal. And that's why we want to find out who can sing. I know this is going over like screen doors on a submarine, but I'm just going to tell you right now, I'm still going to preach it. I'm still going to preach it. I know water's seeping in, and we're about to have a flood right now. Some of you's looking at me like a calf looking at a new gate, man. You're just, I mean, you're like, what in the world? That preacher, where did he come from? I thought he was nice. I am nice, but I'm also compassionate and very passionate about this choir. Amen. I'm passionate about this church. I want things to be done right. And I, I want people to be faithful. Hey, we need a revival of faithfulness. Faithfulness, just if you're supposed to be somewhere, be there. And if you ain't, at least have the de decency to let us know. Hey, I'm not going to be there. Can somebody fill my spot? Can somebody do this? And there's so, several of you today that, that let me know before church and before even this evening, I'm not going to be able to be there. And, 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 and can you have somebody help? Hey, that is good. Let's take it up a step. Let's just try to be there. Let's just try to be there. If God's going to move this church forward, and I believe He wants to, I believe He wants to. As a matter of fact, I know He wants to. Folks, we're going to have to be ready. This little core crowd right here on Sunday night, with an exception of a few families that couldn't be here, we are the core of the church. we got some that just come on Sunday morning. I love them. We need them. Thank God for them. One day the light bulb might come on. They need to come back. That's great. But until they do, we're the core for the church to go forward. Let me just say, faithful. I know I'm preaching to the choir tonight. Sunday night crowds, that's a faithful crowd. That's a faithful crowd that comes back in... in, in to, but I, let's remain faithful. Responsibility meetings, special events, special activities, work, serving. Hey, how about witnessing? Man, if you're in charge of a bus or you're in charge of a, a, a Sunday school class, visit, check on kids and say, well, I've had a kid that missed two or three weeks in a row. How about you personally take it on yourself to check on that child. Check on that child. Hey, why have you been missing? What's going on? Well, I, I, we had a death in the family. Or we had this and that. Get inside that home because the church is important. That kid's important. You realize every child that comes on this property on Sunday is special to God. And if he's special or she's special to God, then she should be special to this church. There is nobody sitting in here tonight that's not special. You say, preacher, why are you going through all the trouble to do something for the nursery? Because those babies are special to God. I mean, they're special. You say, well, why are you about to pull your hair out and your beard's all gray? And I'll tell you why. It's the nursery. No, it ain't. Yeah, I'd have, I, honestly, I beat my head against the wall a few times. What do we do? What do we do? And, uh, but I believe God's gave us a clear path on what to do. But I'll say this. Folks, it's, you say, well, why don't we just, why don't we, well, first of all, you heard me this morning. It, you know, the parent, if they want to bring a baby in here, let them bring it in here. But I thank God for all the parents that put them back here, because if we had, how many babies we have this morning? Twelve? Well, you put twelve babies in here on top of the uh, couple we had this morning. We got havoc, the other kind of havoc. But I, I can preach with the best of them. You, they're screaming. It doesn't bother me. I preached in churches before where they didn't even believe in nurseries. You were liberal if you had a nursery. Amen. And I mean, them old-fashioned churches didn't have them. Amen. And so uh, they didn't even believe in them. They said, everybody must be under the sound preaching of God's Word. Bah! 
you know, and it's just, it's, it's utter chaos in there. And I'm thinking, it's really helping that baby out, amen. And, uh, but still, I thank God for all the nurseries. And by the way, ladies, if you're assigned to, to work in the nursery, work in the nursery. You're just as important as what I'm doing right now. Oh, that's not that important. I'll tell you what's important, friend, is the church. Every, every avenue of the church, everything of the church is important. The, the guys that work out here in the junior church, at preaching junior church, oh, they don't have the platform in here, but they're preaching to the future. Oh, yes. That's why I want our junior churches to be. I want to, it just, God, why? It's the bride of Christ. It's the bride of Christ making havoc of the church. We, how does this happen? We make havoc when we desert the meetings of the church. Number two, and I'm hastening, we, must, we, we make havoc of the church when we distort the message of the church. When we distort the message of the church. Acts chapter 8 and verse number 4, Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Saul here is trying to stop and hinder the message of the gospel. Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. The message is not about citizenship. The message is not about taking care of the planet. The message is not about cooperation with everything and everybody. Hey, the message is not even about collection, gathering all that you can. I'll tell you what the message is. The message is salvation. Amen. Hey, the message is salvation from sin by the blood of Christ. The message is about satisfaction with the precious life that I have given up. Uh, the, bless, the message is about sanctification, God's Word cleaning my life up. The message is about submission, giving my life to the Lord. Hey, the message is about serving, serving God and serving the church. Hey, that's what the message is about. I'm not up here being a motivational preacher. I don't even know what motivational speaking is. All I know what to do is get up here and rear back, clear out a spot, and preach the Word. Amen. And that's exactly what there was folks in here when they came in here this morning. I got a stack of visitor cards that deep from this morning, and I was preaching this morning, and people was like this. I want it to where I'm preaching sometimes, and you can see the wind blowing off their face. You know? and, and I, hey, I like it that way. You say, why? Because that you know you're plugged in when somebody's looking at you like this, and, uh, and you're preaching. Because most places you go to today, it's, it's uh, open thou thy Bible. Open it up to God's Word. And there, it's almost like a Gregorian chant, and they're monotone, and you're falling asleep, and it's dead, and it's twice plucked up by the roots, dead, and, and I mean nothing happening, and you can skate down the aisles because it's cold. And folks, listen, I want to go to a place where a preacher's sweating, and he's all bug-eyed, and, and, and foam coming out of his mouth, and veins popping out, and he's all red in the face. You say, why? You know, at least he's saying something. Folks, today, it's, I'm telling you, it is, a rare, it is a rare thing to see somebody really clear off a, a patch and preach. But we got, we've needed it more than we've ever needed it before today. Today. Hey, it doesn't matter if the President of the United States walks in and sets some. It doesn't matter who's in here. Hey, we are commanded to preach the Word. Preach it. God has chose preaching. Hey, our message is about salvation. Our message is about sanctification. Hey, number three, we make havoc when we despise the messenger of the church. We, we make havoc when we despise the messenger of the church. You know what 1 Peter 5, 2 says? Feed the flock of God, which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, by, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but, a, for, uh, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. This is to the preacher, the pastor. This is a message here that I'm not supposed to be a hireling. I'm not supposed to be up here for filthy lucre or money and just getting a paycheck from the church. I'm here commanded to feed the flock of God. I'm here to preach the Word. And hopefully every time you come to church, we open up the Word of God and I give you a message to feed you. But now, listen folks, if you're not here, you can't be fed. You know, if Mama had supper on the table, it was only there for an available time. Amen? And you can go back and you can watch past messages, but there's nothing like being in the house of God when it's going on. 
because that's the house of God where two or three are gathered together. We ought to be there when we assemble together. Hey, we despise the messenger of the church is his preaching ministry. Amen. What I just told you is a preaching ministry. Feed the flock. That's the main job. The main job of the pastor is not to do all the little side jobs, which this preacher don't mind doing. I don't mind visiting the sick. I don't mind visiting the shut-ins. I don't mind doing the work. Man, yesterday I was killing weeds out here and pulling them up and spraying weeds and, and sweeping off the, the sidewalks. I don't mind doing none of that stuff. But the main job of the pastor is to feed the flock. So if I'm getting just a few minutes a week to study then I'm actually doing a discredit or disservice to the church. Amen? And if you read that early church, and I'm not going to go into that, a lot of those deacons did a lot of the work, and that preacher fed the flock. Amen? So we've drifted so far away. It's a preaching ministry. It's a pastoring ministry, taking the oversight. Hey, this ministry is a pleasing ministry, willingly, pleased to do it. Folks, you're looking at a man who is unworthy to pastor this church, but I am so pleased to do it. I mean, I'm having the time of my life. I'm, I love pastoring this church. I love, now, I, I ain't saying I'm a good pastor. What I'm saying is, I love pastoring this, this flock. This is a wonderful group of people, a wonderful flock. I love seeing the flock grow. But if it never grew any more to what it's grown today, I would still be content and still be happy. Because it's a good, it's a good group of people. It's a great pleasure. Hey, I love it. It's a proper ministry, not lucre, not ready mind. It's a protection ministry, not in charge, just making sure none else is. That's the way to put it, isn't it? You know, anything that has two heads is a freak, ain't it? Y'all like that? That's one way of putting it. You got three or four that, you got a bunch of chiefs and not enough Indians? Well, that's called a messed up church. Oh, this pastor, and then this one's a pastor, and then that one's the pastor. Well, which this is the teaching pastor. This is the preaching pastor. That's the singing pastor. That's the pastor. We don't know what he does, but he's a pastor. And <laughs> Folks, that's called a confusing mess. Now, I, I believe that a, a pastor can have an assistant or associate and all that stuff, but you, you better know who's in charge. There's one pastor. And that pastor is called God's given them a pastoral authority. There's authority. And when you buck that authority, friend, that's a dangerous thing. It's a dangerous thing. Hey, I remember my dad, there was a lady who tried to stir up some things. She, she would get on Facebook and she would just say a bunch of stuff and she was not right with the Lord. She was living a, a really, really um, displeasing life. And she started causing a few little issues in the church. And folks were coming to my dad and uh, he was, uh, of course, I was on staff. I was an associate there, and uh, he would tell me about it, and he'd say, son, you know, maybe you need to go and, and talk to her, and, and uh, you know, he, he didn't want to get too involved in it because, again, he was wanting to still be able to, 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 to help her, and so he, he kind of wanted me to go, and I was a little gun shy, you know, because I'm like, man, I don't know what she'd say about me. She was dangerous, dangerous. And uh, it was one of them things where you were hoping that God would just send her on her way because she was causing some issues. And, or at least get right with God. We were praying two things. Send her off, you know, and, or, or get her right with God. And sometimes you just got to give it over to the Lord. And so she was saying stuff on, on, on the social media and just not, not pleasing to the Lord and hurting the church. And so during our revival, this has been three years ago, uh, this is one of the most God things I've ever seen in my life. My dad looked back in the back and he said, he, he wasn't necessarily looking at her, but he said there was a bunch of people who got right with God. Matter of fact, we had a week revival that turned into two weeks, and 89 people got saved. And it was amazing, amazing place, amazing, amazing service, amazing revival. But he said, there's somebody in here tonight that you refuse to get right with God, you refuse to get right with God. Now this ain't going to go over well with some of you, but this is one of them things, a warning from God that we talked about in Jonah this morning. He said, God has done told me through His Word today and through prayer that if you don't get right with God, you ain't going to be here for the rest of the revival. Now he said that at the closing, he said it with a good spirit, and then he prayed and we walked out. It was over. It was over. I said, Dad, where did that come from? 
He said, I'm just, that's a fair warning for some folks in here that's playing around with God. That woman that night worked a third shift job at a hotel. We got a call about 4 o'clock in the morning that she got hit head on by a truck and took her out into eternity. It, it devastated my dad. I remember the state highway patrol could not get a hold. She didn't have, any, she didn't have a mom and a dad, and she uh, was living by herself. And again, like I said, she was living in very, very, uh, very deep sin, what she was involved in when it first came out. And so she wasn't living right. She, was, she, she said she was saved. I personally, I, I don't know, but I know this, that she had a warning. And I mean, the man of God got up as clear as a bell, and he said, don't leave this building. There's a chance that you can get right with God. There's a chance that you can get either saved or right with God, but don't leave. Get it settled. And she refused. And instead, said some things later on, and God said, well, that's it. Now, I believe the pastor that day was in tune with the Holy Ghost in church, let me just tell you right now, there is a heavy, heavy that hangs over your head when you raise up against the man of God. It would be better for you to walk away and say, I'm not saying a word, I'm not lifting a hand, I'm not going to go up against the man of God. If I don't agree, I'll walk away, but I'm not going to rise up and talk about him and bash him because that's God's man and there's danger that comes along with that. By the way, that's any, that's any man of God. And by the way, I believe that goes for other men of God who bash other men of God. You just, if you don't agree, just keep your mouth shut. But I'll tell you this, friend, uh, there is something that, right, I get, do you see that preacher up there? Yeah, I'll tell you, he's blah, blah, blah. And you just run them down, your kids hear it. Well, then you can just forget about your kids ever serving God. Man, I listen, I was a youth pastor for 14 years, and I heard kids... Literally, preacher, you don't know what they say about the preacher. They'll smile on the way out the door and they'll get in the car and criticize every word he said. In front of the children. First of all, you shouldn't even do that behind closed doors. But listen, friend, when you're just sitting there and you're, you're literally discrediting the man of God in front of your children, you are doing irreparable damage to your children. You are taking God's authority for this earth, the under-shepherd of the church, and you're ripping him out of the plate, and you're stomping on him and saying, hey, we don't believe him, we're all a show. Friend, that's doing damage to the man of God, doing damage to the church, and doing damage to your family. Dude, listen... Friend, if I knew that it was uh, causing that kind of issue with your family and, and you were doing that, I would rather you find a church which you are in agreement with your family or agreement with God and that preacher and salvage your family rather than stay here and tear your family apart. I care about your family that much to say, hey, if you can't grow here, then grow somewhere else. But keep your family together and don't criticize the man of God, any man of God, especially in front of your children. Oh, it damages your children when we discredit and we despise the messenger of the church. And lastly, we make havoc when we disturb the membership of the church. We make havoc when we disturb the membership of the church. Notice Acts chapter 8 and verse number 3. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committing them to prison. I preached a little bit this morning on sheep, but you know, sheep are directionless. They must have a leader. I told you all this morning that sheep are similar to, 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 to women. They, they, they have no sense of direction. I'm joking. And uh, that, uh, they, they do. My wife's probably better with directions than I am. But that was just a joke. So uh, I did get some glares a minute ago. Amen. And uh, sheep are directionless, though. They really are. They, they, they really are. Naturally, sheep wander astray. They go. They, they can't find their way. They need a leader. They need a shepherd. Hey, sheep are naturally dumb. I mean, they really are. They're not the brightest. Now, they look cute and furry and fuzzy and wooly and all that stuff, but they are not bright. Amen. They about even spiritual things. You say, preacher, why are you discipling folks? Why are you teaching? Because they're newborn babes in Christ. And they're sheep. What do we do? We win them and we just stare at them? Feed yourself. What if you just had a baby, mothers, and you just sit there and look at the baby and say, just find food for yourself. 
Oh no, friend, that baby would starve to death. When we have, when we have sheep, when we have new babes in Christ, 1 Peter 2, 2, they desire the sincere milk. We're supposed to nurture them and, and we're supposed to be there for them and guide them in spirit and in truth. And we, sheep are naturally directionless. They're naturally dumb. Hey, they're naturally destructive. They can do great damage if not led. Amen? They can just wander about. Can you imagine a church that really didn't have a leader? It would be a mess. And then lastly, they're disturbed easily. The least little thing disturbs the sheep. That's just natural. Sheep are easily disturbed. What disturbs the membership? Devouring. Devouring by predators, using people for your own gain. That's what disturbs the sheep. Devouring. You know what the enemy of the sheep is? Is wolves. Wolves. I, I met with a guy this week, and he... Uh, he uh, was, we we're talking about, you know, do, just walking all over the property and he was giving me ideas and, and all that. And, and he's a church consultant. And this man knows. He's pastored. He's, he's known. And he said, preacher, you know it's a proven fact that 10% of your congregation is not for you. That's what he said. Is that encouraging? That's what he, it didn't encourage me. He said it's a proven fact. That 10% of your congregation is not for you. Now, tonight, if I had to guess who the 10% is, I would fail. I really would. I wouldn't know who it is tonight. I, I can speculate, but I, that's all it would be. But I'm not commanded to preach those that's for me. I'm supposed, to, I'm supposed to feed the flock. If you're under the sound of my voice, this shouldn't be anything between you and me. Now, if there's something between you on your end to me, I'd like to know about it. There shouldn't be anything between the pastor who would hinder me from preaching the word to you. But you know what a wolf will do? He'll come in and say, Hey, come here. Let's meet in the hallway. Let's, let, uh, won't you come by the house? Let's talk about the church. You know, I don't agree with the preacher. He's a good guy. And boy, don't you think he's so, he's just so energetic. And he gets up there and flails his arms and screams and spit flying the second row. And, you know, isn't that so cute? But I just, I just don't know if that's going to fly here in Simpsonville. I mean, you know, I just don't know how well that's going to go over with our congregation, our parish. Amen. They always use those words. Amen. Them Catholic words. Amen. And uh, I don't know how that's going to go over real well. You know what they're doing? They're using people to build themselves up to discredit the pastor. You know what we call that? They call it a wolf. And they creep in. Hey, they can be a young person, or they can be one of the most elderly, esteemed, saintly, smiling. Just everybody likes them, but behind closed doors they're devouring. And guess what they like to feed on? They like to feed on young Christians. Young sheep. Hey, you just got saved. Oh, come here. Let me, let me take you under my claws. <laughs> Little Red Riding Hood. Hey, I, I just honestly, I've been meeting with some of these Jose and Brian and some of these Artemis and different ones that's been recently saved. And I'll just warn you fellas, you be careful. Certain, they start saying, well, we like the church, but. Well, that but's probably not good. Well, there's some good stuff happening down there, but you say, well, I better just, mm, I better just keep my distance because there's devouring going on. Dividing. What disturbs the membership, not only devouring, but dividing, choosing sides. I hope you don't have to choose sides in this church. Whose side you on? Well, I'm on God's side. Amen? I'm on God's side. Hey, no dividing, only being close to certain people. We don't like cliques either, amen? We don't want cliques in the church. It's not our four and no more. And we don't want, oh, that's my pew and only these people can sit on my seats. And uh, We don't like that. Oh, no. Hey, we want everybody to feel welcome at Bible Baptist Church. It doesn't matter what you live in. It doesn't matter the color of your skin. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor. It doesn't matter if you're this or that. Hey, what matters is... You're one of God's children. Amen. Dividing, choosing sides. And lastly, discord. God hates discord. Proverbs chapter 6 and verse number 19. A false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among the... A false witness 
that speaketh lies is he that soweth discord among the brethren. Whew. I didn't say that. God said it. If you sow discord among the brethren, you are a false witness. A false witness. Now, my prayer has been from the very beginning that I got voted in. Lord, I don't want to have to ever have to handle a situation where I'd have to ask somebody, you know, are you a wolf and have you been doing this and bring them before the church and dismiss them? You say, that actually happens? Well, according to the Bible, it does. I pray I never have to do that. I don't want to do that. You better be full of God if you do that. But you know what? Sometimes, before the church grows, God purges. You know, in the fall of the year, or in the winter, rather, you're supposed to cut these trees back in order for them to look beautiful in the spring, in the summer. Now, a few of these trees hadn't seen cutting, amen. <laughs> amen, Brother Joel. Uh, some of these trees hadn't seen a knife or a, or a hacksaw or a whatever. We got, well, they ain't seen them in a few years, and they're starting to become, uh, we're starting to be in the forest, amen. And uh, uh, we, we've got a few that's tore some trees out here lately and trimmed them, and I thank God for it. Uh, they came out and worked really hard in the most hot week of the year. They came out and did a lot of work. And um, I thank God Brother Joel and Miss Jamie did that. But you know, in order, if you're at your house and you're, you're trimming back trees, you trim them back so their blooms will come out even more full the next year. Sometimes God trims back the church a little bit so His gospel can go forward even greater. There'll be actually some that come through here before that will hold, try to hold the church back. Be my prayer is, Lord, keep those folks away and send ones that will be laborers. Send la I've not been praying for people to come to the church. I mean, I've been praying for laborers to come. By the way, God is sending some. God is sending some laborers. Why? We don't want wolves. We want laborers. Now, can I look by my physical eyes and look at somebody that walks in the back door and say, there's a laborer and there's a wolf. I can't do it. But the Word of God will reveal it. Now, it may take a while, but I'm not, it ain't your job and it ain't my job to walk up and try to, try to find the zipper so you can unzip that sheep costume and find a wolf ear poking out. Amen? Looking at their hooves. You know, watching them sheep. I believe that's a wolf. Well, no. We might have a few wolf dogs in here, but I ain't figured them out either. Amen? Sick them, you know, and I ain't figured that out. But folks, listen, we ought to pray for the church. We ought not try to make havoc of the church. We ought to love the church. It's the bride of Christ. Hey, Saturdays, we ought to get out here and witness, love the church, grab you some tracks, witness. Hey, the bus ministry is going forward. The RU ministry is going forward. Hey, this, uh, uh, the, uh, the Good News Club's about to kick off. We're having kickoff Sunday with two new Sunday school classes. If you're in the choir, be in the choir. If you want to sing special music, sing special music. But let's not make havoc of God's church. If anything, let's kick it up a notch and say glory to God. Let's see the church go forward. Let's close.